purpose of my talk is basically to give an overview and really understand what CK is, the drawbacks, and what it actually means, and when to actually use the CK level as a as a measure for a possible neuromuscular um, for my myopathy. I have no closure. Right, so I'm going to start out with going over the basic biochemistry of CK, then we'll have a section really going into what normal values, um, <clears throat> normal values mean. And then there are multiple factors which can actually affect the levels of CK, which are not actually um, related to a myopathy. Um, and then we'll talk about actually using CK as a biomarker for muscle disease, and then approaches to a patient with elevated CK, and also patients with asymptomatic elevations. So this is kind of a classic case. You have a, a healthy patient presenting the, their PCP with calf pain or some injury, and they incidentally get their CK check. And it's 890, which is elevated per the, the according to the lab. And so what does that mean? They have a normal neuro exam. He has Achilles tendonitis. That's the reason for his pain. And he's, he gets prescribed physical therapy and gets better. So what, what do you do with that? So that's keep that in mind, and then we'll kind of go over CK, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so starting very at the very beginning, what is creatine? So creatine is the creatine and creatine kinase. So it's found in vertebrates. It's actually um, produced by the body, but can be absorbed as a supplement as well, and it's primarily synthesized in the liver and the kidneys. It's made from two amino acids, glycine and arginine, and can be transported to the muscle via the bloodstream. So what is the reason that we use creatine? So in the muscle, there is a phosphocreatine system where the energy from ATP, which is the currency of energy in the cell, can be transferred to creatine to form phosphocreatine. And Creatine kinase is the enzyme that actually catalyzes that reaction. So it's used by tissues that have a high demand for energy. So muscle is a classic example, but it, the brain is also a different example, which also utilizes high amounts of energy and needs energy fairly quickly at times. And creatine is used as a buffer to store this energy so it can be quickly converted back to ATP when the ATP is needed. So here's a diagram of the muscle. So in the muscle, there's a small amount of ATP, and there's quite a bit more creatine. And creatine kinase converts that ATP to phosphocreatine. And as the muscle at rest produces ATP, it can basically use that creatine to act as a battery to store energy. So when the muscle needs energy, the creatine kinase can transfer it back to ATP and that can be utilized for muscle contraction. So here's a diagram of creatine kinase. So it functions as a dimer. So there are actually two. There are two subunits that are um, linked in the middle here, and there are actually two kind of flavors of the subunit. There's a M-type subunit and a B-type subunit. So the different tissues have different kind of variations of this. So skeletal muscle, the creatine kinase has two M subunits, and the brain has two B subunits, um, and cardiac muscle actually has one of each. That's where the CK, NB, and the kind of cardiac CK comes from. So when you actually send a test and measure your CK, what are you actually doing? So the assay is actually based on enzymatic activity of CK. So you're measuring the amount of activity transferring the phosphate from the phosphocreatine to ADP, and that's actually measured in the lab. So the, the unit of the number that you get is units of activity per liter. Um, there are actually different assays that can be done for CK looking at the CK isozymes. So if you check cardiac enzymes in a CK and get the MB fraction, you're actually measuring the quantity of proteins 
which is a different number. So you can't directly compare those two numbers. They're actually different. Okay, so what is normal? So when you have a lab test, typically what they do is they measure normal values in a population. And those normal values typically fall in a bell-shaped curve, a Gaussian distribution. Um, one thing to think about is they're measuring normals in a, quote, reference population, and that population may not reflect your population. So that's something to keep in mind. So here's an example of hemoglobin, and that clearly falls in this Gaussian distribution. So normal is considered kind of the middle 95%. So abnormal on the bottom is the 2.5% below, and abnormal on the top is the 2.5% above. So when you look at normal, um, total CK is different in terms of normals when you look at the normal values from different laboratories. So why would that be? Um, well, one reason is that the, when you actually look at the creatine kinase distribution in a normal population, it isn't Gaussian. So there, the, it goes up really quick and then there's a really long tail. So when the lab actually formulates a normal value based on this, it doesn't really fit. So the normal values may not actually be accurate for this particular um, test. So there have been big studies looking at what is really normal for creatine kinase. So this is a study in the Netherlands of <clears throat> 1,400 subjects. And when you look at the the upper limit of normal, the 97.5 percentile, and actually look at different uh, ethnic groups, you see that there's different normal values when you, there are actually ethnic differences in CK. So when you actually look at normal values, you actually have to look at your patient and how they fit into that category. So normal for one patient may not be different than a normal for a different patient. So a similar study was done in the United States with a much larger population. This is about 10,000 people. And their average CK was 102. But they saw a similar effect where um, Caucasians have a lower CK than African Americans. And there's a difference between men and women in terms of their normal values. Um, so this is just really illustrating the differences. And, the differences in this study are slightly different than the differences in the Netherlands study. Um, the African American number is quite a bit higher percentage wise compared to Caucasian. So the, there may be some differences just country to country too in terms of different populations are slightly different. So what factors actually affect the CK level that you have to think about? Well, a common one is exercise. So when you look at kind of just healthy people with a fairly kind of low um, level of exercise, so three days, 45 minutes of aerobic exercise in 15 healthy uh, medical students, um, their mean resting CK was about 100 or so average. And when you subject them to this exercise, um, all of them had an increased level of CK. Um, and it ranged from pretty low level of 1.5, like 50% more, up to 34, 35 times the, the level of no, their, their baseline. So clearly in even normal people, low levels of exercise can drastically affect the CK. So that's something you have to keep in mind when you're measuring um, CK in a, in a patient, kind of what level of exercise are, are they um, undertaking. And as you kind of ramp up the level of exercise. Um, this is kind of 500 uh, military recruits. And they're, here again, the differences in ethnic groups. But all of them, after seven days of basic training, had an increase of about five to six times um, their baseline CK. And if you look at what would be considered abnormal, almost 90% of them would have been in the abnormal range if you look at the testing. So 
the question is what is really normal and what is really abnormal. Right? So here's a kind of another higher level of, of exercise, which is marathon run, runners. Um, and in these um, um, people, they at a peak of CK around 1400, about a day afterwards, and then you notice that this gradually does decrease over time, and at eight days, it's, it's basically back to their normal. And this is kind of the extreme. These are ultra marathon runners, and they peaked around 30,000, but also decreased with time. A common question in the neuromuscular clinic is if a patient has a muscular dystrophy or some muscle problem of some sort at baseline, what does exercise do to that? So this is a study looking at the effects of exercise in both controls and patients with different types of muscular dystrophy, so limb girdle, Beckers, and FSHD. Um, and these are cycling tests in which they actually measure the, the oxygen uptake and kind of push the patient to the peak. That's the max test here. But then also test kind of different percentages of the max and see what level of exercise effects are CK. So this is kind of before, right after, and day after. And the controls down here, they do have maybe some increase. And then the, the patients with muscular dystrophies do have a higher baseline. But you can see that exercise at this level, which was, I think, five times of four minutes each with each session, um, they didn't dramatically increase their CK. So, so this level of exercise is presumably safe for them because it's not causing clear signs of muscle breakdown. Um, and in general, I tell patients with, with muscular dystrophies that exercise like this is probably good for them. It's not dangerous. So another thing that can affect the CK level is trauma, and, and a needle EMG can certainly be a form of trauma. So this is a study looking at um, needle EMG with a monopolar needle, which is a little bit thinner, and a concentric needle. And both of these can increase the CK level within a few hours of, of the study. Um, so, so in the clinic, you clearly do not want to be testing a patient's CK immediately after getting an EMG. Um, it does normalize fairly quickly, but that's also something to keep in mind in terms of when you're timing your, your test. So there's a long list of medications that could theoretically um, increase CK. I mean, the common one that everyone's heard about are statins, but there are also a list of other ones. Um, there are some recent case reports about um, anti-epileptics such as glucosamide also increasing CK even in patients that did not have a seizure when they were on glucosamine, so they could not attribute the elevated CK to, the, uh, to a seizure. And looking through the literature, there, there are some interesting things I found about something called macro CK, which you may not have heard of. So macro CKs are atypical um, higher molecular mass variants of CK. So there are actually two different types. There, type one is, is the normal dimer of CK, which is bound by an immunoglobulin. Um, and then type two is made up of polymers of a, a mitochondrial form of CK. So if you take CK protein and run it on uh, a gel um, via isoelectric focusing, you can separate the different isoforms. Um, and this is kind of a schematic of how they would separate. Um, so here's a study looking at um, about 140 patients that they found with macro CK. And wh what they found was that patients that have the type one of macro CK tend to have an elevated CK. Um, a very high percentage of them had a CK over 500. And the thought is that the immunoglobulin kind of decreases the, the, um, the clearance of the CK, so more of it sticks around, so that level is higher. Um, 
Um, the other interesting thing in this kind of um, cohort of patients is that a good percentage of them actually were found to have either a heart or skeletal muscle disease of some sort. Um, many of them had a, what they found was a myositis, possibly autoimmune in nature. So, um, so the takeaways from the macro CK is that it can be a cause of high CK and it can be associated with a myositis. Um, so type two is typically not something you would see in this type of patient. They have a low CK and this one is actually associated with malignancies very commonly. So I guess a quick question is how do you actually test for this? So when you go to the lab um, web page, this is the lab that we use, um, you can order what's called the total CK and the, the isozymes. So the isozymes is, is this test of the proteins. So different labs may actually list it in a different way. It can either be kind of CK electrophoresis or, or basically something looking at the different form, forms of isozymes. So other than muscle disease, there can be other things such as denervation, which can actually also increase CK. So, so things that cause acute denervation of the muscle um, can cause elevations in CK. And an example of this would be patients with either ALS um, or um, SDMA, Kennedy's disease, which are both um, neurodegenerative processes of the motor neuron. So in this kind of cohort of 30 some patients with each of these um, conditions, the range rate ranges from basically normal to fairly elevated, so up to the 2000s in both. And patients with Kennedy's disease do have the majority of them with an elevated CK level. And many of them have it over a thousand. So, so this is a purely neurodegenerative um, neuronal process which is causing an elevation in the CK. So, when you go back to this slide, other things that can cause the innervation theoretically could also cause an elevation in CK as well. So that's something to keep in mind when you see a, a mildly elevated CK. So this is just kind of another long list summarizing all these things. Um, as I mentioned, cardiac disease can cause elevated CK because the MV fraction can be elevated. Um, that used to be used as a marker before troponin, but patients with chronic cardiac disease can also have an elevated CK, which, um, so you need to kind of pay attention to the history. And, and there are other endocrine, toxic, and other effects that can affect the CK. Just as a quick aside, so something that's commonly thought about in relation to CK is this term rhabdomyolysis. Um, so the thought to be from basically large amounts of muscle necrosis. Um, I mean, the main concern is renal failure, but there really is no kind of agreed upon level which kind of says that, okay, you're clearly at risk for renal um, damage. Um, there have been studies looking into the levels and it's been found that the risk for acute kidney injury is actually low if the CK is less than 15,000, which is a pretty high level. Um, but if you have other factors such as sepsis, dehydration, other comorbidities, it can occur at lower levels. And here's a series of patients um, that presented with rhabdomyolysis and all the patients that developed renal failure were above this 15,000 cutoff. And a lot of patients that didn't were actually above it. Okay, so when you think about biomarkers, you want something that is clearly only abnormal in a pathologic state. Um, in practice, the, most biomarkers are kind of variable in the amount of um, sensitivity and specificity. So you really do have to use them in the appropriate clinical setting. So this would not be the appropriate clinical setting for a pregnancy test. So for CK, I mean, it actually is fairly localized in the muscle. Um, so that's a pro. And 
it's mainly in the muscle. I mean, there have been kind of thoughts about using the CKBB um, as a biomarker for brain injuries, and there were studies at the, at the UW when I was a resident looking at CKBB and spinal fluid, but that's not really universally used. Um, and this is easily measurable in serum, and the assay is actually a pretty simple assay. Um, the cons, as we kind of have gone over a little bit, is that there are a lot of non-neuromuscular causes of elevation that can be elevated in normal people in absence of disease, and it's not always elevated. So if you do see a patient with elevated CK, what, what do you actually do? I mean, an important um, thing to look at is weakness. So the, and then the other kind of thought is that if you have a patient with elevated CK, what is the likelihood of actually coming to a specific diagnosis and whether that diagnosis is treatable? And then in the workup, would you want to do something invasive like a muscle biopsy? So I'm go going over myopathy a little quickly because there's a talk after me about uh, muscle disease. But the main signs of possible myopathy, the big one is proximal weakness. That's kind of the most common pattern. But things like exercise intolerance can be associated with metabolic myopathy. Muscular dystrophies can have a family history. Myotonia can be associated with um, myotonic dystrophies. And then there can be other signs, either in history or exam, that could suggest something other than a primary muscle problem. So if someone has a fatigable weakness, then they're, you would think maybe myasthenia. If they have sensory symptoms, clearly that cannot be from a muscle problem. Fasciculations would point you towards a motor neuron disease, which can, as I said, elevate CK, or reflex abnormalities, um, which, which suggests more of a neuropathy. So EMG is a kind of a clear next step often in really looking at the muscle a little bit more closely. And its usefulness can be trying to rule out other causes, as I've just mentioned. Um, and there are other signs, such as myotonia, which could point towards uh, a myotonic dystrophy. And one of the main kind of things you're looking for are, are there changes on the e needle EMG that which suggests possible myopathy. Uh, and then you would have to decide, okay, would you want to go on to the gold standard, which is muscle biopsy? And these are the, the tests that are typically done, but the, basically you want to choose a muscle that you think is more likely to be affected, that you haven't irritated with um, the EMG, um, poking it with a needle. And then you can do MRI of the muscle to sometimes help guide the biopsy or to help give you a little bit more evidence that there is a, uh, a myositis or some muscle problem. When you actually look at patients that go on to have a muscle biopsy, and here's a series of almost 700 patients at a neuromuscular referral center, 23% um, were found to have an inflammatory myopathy. Um, and when you look at the actual percentages, patients without weakness with a normal EMG actually coming up to a specific myopathy as a diagnosis is very low. So only 7 to 14 percent. As you add clinical features such as weakness or a positive EMG or both, the percentage goes, goes up by quite a bit. The CK level, if it's elevated, actually does not help increase this in these patients without weakness and without an EMG, without a positive EMG. Um, but in the patients that have one of these positives or both of them positive, the degree of elevation of CK is associated with a higher probability of finding a specific diagnosis or a myopathy in general. Okay. So that's kind of the, the patients with weakness, which I went over quickly. Um, but there's this whole group of patients that don't have weakness on exam, or they have these kind of weird general symptoms, fatigue, um, muscle pain. Um, so there actually are kind of guidelines from the European Federation of Neurology looking at these, this particular group of patients. Um, and 
in terms of trying to optimize the sensitivity and specificity, they chose a definition of elevated CK as one that's 1.5 the upper limit of normal. Um, and these are the numbers that they were using. And these were based on that study in the Netherlands of looking at normal CK levels in those patients. So that's where they get these numbers. So it's 1.5 the upper limit of normal from that previous slide. Um, so, and that's where those numbers come from. So they do kind of grade the different um, ethnic groups different and different sexes differently. So they're defining asymptomatic um, hyperCKemia as either no symptoms or having no weakness, no atrophy, hypertrophy, myotonia, or just kind of these vague symptoms. So you wanna rule out things that are not neuromuscular, check the family history. Um, so this is what kind of looking at exercise, you wanna confirm that it's real. You wanna have at least two measurements and not have the patients um, exercise prior to these measurements. And if it's still elevated, you wanna check an EMG. And they recommend a biopsy if the EMG is positive, if the CK is three times normal, if they're young because there's a higher chance for a muscular dystrophy, if there's exercise intolerance, which is associated with a metabolic myopathy, which can have a normal CK, or women that have a lower level of, of elevations because they can be a carrier for some of these other muscular dystrophies. So if you look at muscle biopsies in patients with asymptomatic um, elevations of CK, so this is 460 patients, a lot of them were normal. Most of, a lot of them were nonspecific myopathy with no specific diagnosis, and only 26% had a specific diagnosis. And these diagnoses are typically not treatable, either a metabolic myopathy or a, a mild muscular dystrophy. So in terms of prognosis, I mean, what actually happens to these patients? So this is a study looking at 55 patients over six years, so six years later. And when you follow them, most remain asymptomatic. Only one became symptomatic. A lot of them still have had an elevated CK, which suggests that that probably was their normal. And then some of them actually normalized their CK. So maybe their CK was elevated because of exercise or some other cause. And only a couple of them were diagnosed with a specific neuromuscular issue. And what about exercise in these patients? So this is a similar um, kind of looking at levels of exercise in patients um, with kind of a baseline elevated hyper, elevated CK. And either super or maximal or submaximal, these patients tend not to have any kind of increased susceptibility to elevate their CK with exercise. So this is kind of a schematic looking at the approach based on those guidelines. So let's kind of go back to our case. So this 24-year-old gentleman, elevated CK of 890, normal exam, he does exercise. Um, so if they check the CK after three weeks without exercise, check it again in six months, he was around 600 to 800. So what do you do with this patient? So looking at kind of the number here and going back to the guidelines and the normal values, I mean, he's African-American, his, his normal is higher. So even though the lab is saying that his CK is abnormal, in this case, it's probably normal. So you probably want to reassure him. So basically, CK is a good biomarker for muscle disease because of its specificity, but there are a lot of kind of pitfalls. You want to kind of make sure that you really kind of think about what really what is really normal and abnormal. Look at factors such as exercise that can clearly elevate CK even in healthy people. And weakness should really increase your suspicion for a neuromuscular disease. And typically patients with um, elevated CK without symptoms, they have a benign prognosis. Um, so it's probably normal for them. And depending on the context, muscle biopsy can really range in terms of the, the, the sensitivity of finding a specific diagnosis. Okay, that's it.